Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Are we recording? Okay. So this evening we're going to be talking with Dolly Kola, Victor, and Nate Lewis about their work and their practice. And I'd like to start the night off with a quick introduction of each one of the panelists. Dolly, would you like to start? Hello, my name is Dolly Founder and director of Red Traffic Gallery. Uh, we are doing one 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 pop up here in collaboration with Human Morgan. It's been an amazing experience in which we've had Victor and Nate Lewis, as well as Shirley Sunbar's works on exhibit. Uh, I'm sure, I hope you guys have had a chance to see the exhibition and we'd like to talk more about it uh, as we close off tonight, as the, as the final day of the show. So, welcome. Um, Nate Lewis, um, an artist, making work with um, paper, photos, um, sculpting methods, work with sound a little bit, and the video as well. I uh, live in New York City now, I lived in Mason for 10 years before I moved here, and that's where I started uh, making art at the time. Victor Icameno, artist, I'm a writer, I'm a multi multidisciplinary artist. Uh, I have my practice both here in the U.S. and also in Lagos, Nigeria. So it's a pleasure to be showing here in New York for the first time. Thank you. Thank you so much, panelists, for joining us. I'd like to start the conversation off this evening by talking about the importance of the work that Dali is doing to bring the work of the continent and artists that are from the continent of Africa to the U.S. and beyond. And I think that it's a really great way to set the tone of the evening um, and move the conversation forward. So Dolly, <clears throat> I'd like to ask, why is it that at this time you've decided to branch out and bring your gallery to the US market? Well, I mean, expanding to the US has always been one of the things that we've had on our, on our roster. Uh, I think now in particular seems to be the most opportune moment. I think as a result of a lot of the changes that occurred over the last two years, uh, there's been a shift in mindset, uh, both on a social level and a political level in the United States in terms of inclusion, accessibility, diversity. And I think that this is a time, it's a golden age in, in black art. Um, but what we really wanted to do is to create not just a connection in terms of what African American art has to offer in the blue chip, high level art world space, but in terms of what is the connection between the continent, between the roots and the diaspora. Mm -hmm. um, there seems to have been this diversion and this disconnect between African contemporary art and black art. And it seems to be having, we seem to be having two completely separate conversations. But I, I would like to posit that they are two sides of the same coin and in a way it's a continuation of the storyline. Uh, that diaspora and art is part of the continental social fabric. It's part of our cultural heritage is part of the conversation of the future and the past. And a lot of contemporary African artists today are talking about are looking back to heritage, looking back to the past in terms of re-examining what contemporary art means then today. And that past is a shared history that we have. It's one that I would like us to continue engaging with. And I think that this is just the beginning. Um, I would love to see more diaspora relations, continental diaspora relations between the continent of West Africa, of Africa, West Africa, East Africa, the Southern Hemisphere um, of the African continent, and yes, Africa, you know, African Americans, but also the Caribbean, Afro Latinos. Um, there's a lot of conversations to be had, and I think that this is just the beginning of many of them. Wonderful, thank you for that contribution. And to the artists, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your thoughts of bridging the gap between the continent and artists of the diaspora, and some of your personal feelings and opinions about how do we make that link to back to the continent, back to our source, but how do we also connect with where we are? Feel free to start, anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess uh, it's interesting to you know think about the conversation. You know, for me, I mean, my like family roots is from uh, like Trinidad and Barbados, 
um, but I've, you know, I've lived in the United States my entire life, so, you know, thinking about African American versus um, in the diaspora, but, you know, ultimately, you know, we're all African. So, I mean, I've been shaped by living here, but I have roots and I have family, you know, um, you know, from the islands, but, um, so it just interests me to think how it ends up, how, if there's a specific thing in my work that manifests, you know, like from, um, like where, where I'm from. Um, but uh, I think the, the importance um, that I see it is just um, thinking about the ways the, the, in, in the history of things, really. And um, I think here in the United States, you know, we're just trying to trace back the roots, you know, to Africa. And, um, and they're trying to trace the roots back, you know, within, within themselves. So we're all trying to, we're all doing a lot of the same work, you know, just in different, uh, different time zones and different geographies, but it's all uncovering, it feels like it's like all uncovering and uplifting just a history that has just been hidden from us, you know, the truth within it. It sounds a lot like you're talking about soul searching, that yeah. there's almost this global soul searching among perhaps African people, among black people, among people of the diaspora who have left their roots to end up somewhere else and are trying to understand the link between where they come from and where they are. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think I uh, like identify and see it within, see it within music hmm. more than anything. We talked about that recently. Yeah, yeah, I see it within that more than anything. And, you know, I can trace that more than anything. You know, my antenna connects to that more than anything and understands that more than anything. And I think it really, I think it's more, um, I think you can actually see that language, you know, in music more than anything, especially if you trace back the time of now to, um, and the different genres, you know, within music and then tracing it back, you know, to, to Africa. And, yeah. Victor, what are some of your thoughts about, about the question, finding that link between the continent and coming to the U.S.? As someone who is Nigerian-born, lived in the U.S. for many years, and has straddled both worlds, which is a very different experience than Nate. Yeah. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Nate. Um, I'll start off with uh, that strand of history, because whereas Nate... Can everyone hear us? Can everyone hear? Okay. Yeah, louder? Louder? Hello. <laughs> there you go. Louder. <laughs> All right, we, we know. But yeah, Chessy, you know, you can throw it up a little bit if you want. Uh, but like Nate said, whereas he's kind of drawing the link in, in, in music, I, from my own beginning with somebody that sees history as, as material, not just uh, an abstract material, but actually physical material, I draw my, my own from, from, from literature because um, Historically, when you look at that strand, when you look at that bridge, a lot of the past writers, uh, Langston Hughes actually traveled to throughout Africa uh, because he had the opportunity of being a ship uh, worker. Um, you look at people like uh, James Baldwin, you look at Maya Angelou, you know, so there is, there is that, there is that going back, that seesaw going back, borrowing from where you are coming from. Um, which the word borrowing is not the right word. The word is just kind of assessing your inner, inner self because you don't have to do that much to be yourself. You know, as, as a black artist, whatever you are, whatever you find yourself, um, there's a lot of that DNA in you that you are going to resurrect and all of that. But with what we are doing right now, we are building off of what has been built before, uh, creating that bridge to, 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 to continue a, a more generational, conversation for somebody like me to to be showing with Nate as well, you know, as well as Cherry Sharma who, who is not here today. You know, it's a it's a continuation, it's a strand, you know, so at some point it gets broken, you have a valley like this, then we start building it back up again, you know. So sometimes it's it's quite exciting, sometimes it can be a bit hectic. I wanted to uh, put a question to each one of you about the idea that we're going through a black renaissance. 
We're going through a period that's just a fleeting moment and black art is selling at a rapid pace, at a rapid price, and it's speaking to either a moment in, in the art industry or, or what? Uh, well, <laughs> it, it, it depends. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's for us to determine whether or not it is just a, a phase or if we're building routes to ensure that it's sustainable. I mean, the question isn't, doesn't have an, e an easy answer. The solution lies in each of us, and that lies in both the artists but also the institutions. Now, as a gallerist, um, my job and my curatorial portfolio is primarily contemporary African arts and the diaspora. Um, but what I do essentially is to elevate African and black voices to a global platform. Um, I do that from the vantage point of being an African gallerist and curator. But our goal is to expand beyond our immediate horizon and to build institutions and branches all over the world in order for it to be accessible. The only way we can ensure that it is not a phase is by ensuring that we also build the institutions, the platforms, the ecosystems, locally and internationally, to ensure that we are not held hostage or relying on Western platforms um, to give us access. Now, I'm happy that Western platforms are giving us access today as a result of agitation, as a result of people demanding for their rights. But for how long will that last? How long will a sense of shame or guilt resonate in the minds of collectors, patrons, curators? At a certain point, the conversation will shift to something else. And then what? Will we knock on the door again and ask us to ask them to let us say no? The question is not the door is open. Now we put our boots in and we build and build relationships. Now for me, the key to that relationship and that ecosystem is to ensure that there is a global black market. And that market isn't just amongst African Americans. There is a huge industry and ecosystem that can be tapped into by building relationships between collectors, patrons, museums, artists, galleries from the Ivory Coast, Cape Capo Verde, Nigeria, the United States, Brazil, um, uh, Haiti, Jamaica, building that ecosystem that we have that is independent of the global art scene, but also a part of it. So I'm not, I'm not advocating for um, segregation. And I, and I, I'm advocating for inclusion. And that inclusion means that we have to invest into our own industries and our own culture. And I think that this is the beginning of that change. And these conversations, these exhibitions, these exchanges are part of creating that social awareness and consciousness that we need to engaging in and advocating for so that it's not just a phase in time. Artists, your thoughts? Yeah, um, I guess I don't think it's just um, the renaissance within uh, like black art as you're saying. I feel like it's just like uh, just a tectonic shift of just uh, receiving, um, you know, just black people and black culture and just black individuals as being valuable and, um, and worthy. Um, I think about that just in terms of just like black people be coming into leadership and you know, big companies and CEOs and presidents of this and presidents of that and thinking about representation and first black person on this, you know, on this magazine cover and um, first black person to just within film and just all of the industries really industries and just parts of society, I think there's just a shift of, yeah, just black people being received as valuable and worthy with bringing worth um, to, to the world, really. I think they just, um, for so long, uh, clearly they weren't given a voice. So I don't think it's just within art. I think it's just within everything, really. So, so you're speaking to something that's yeah. of our time. It's, yeah. it's less about the art world and more about where we are in the world. Absolutely, for sure. That's how I see it. And um, so with it being art, with art being part of that, I think, um, you know, the first, because I mean, you know, if you think, you think about other, especially I always bring up music because music has been received, you know, black people have been received for years, you know, with music, but for art, 
art kind of, I think art ends up being this, um, it's not the least amount of work you have to do to get the highest return, mm -hmm. but I think it's, it's art is, it's, it's, it's intellect, you know, it's an idea, and essentially, it's going to be like the last thing that, um, how I see it, it'll be the last thing that's going to be worth money, that's going to be an investment, because it's essentially the least you have to do to get a big return, so it's paying for just like an intellect and idea. So to me, art is, it seems like would be the last thing. And right now, you know, with it, I think the first thing that happens with, um, with, with that is representing, um, you know, figures of work being a big thing right now. It's like the first thing that artists are going to make and the first thing that's gonna be received is the basic, the most basic thing of representation who people are. So I think this is just the very beginning. And because now that there's an audience, you know, and now that people's ideas are being deemed worthy in their minds and their culture, I think um, that, I think that it will just continue to, you know, that black people will just be continue to just dive into their wild imaginations and Essentially, they're gonna have to. It'll it'll shift that they determine like what is being made and what is gonna be bought and what is gonna be um, deemed valuable and interesting. So, I think it's just the very beginning, really. Victor, <clears throat> I think there's always a movement in the art world, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, almost like a clockwork. And when that happens, uh, how do you how do you uh, mine it? You know, so. What is exciting about it? I mean, like there's, there's this term that that is often used every every other decade, like African Rising. You see on big magazine, African Rising, African Rising. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't want to hear it anymore. You know? so I've, I've heard it for way too long. Um, but what is exciting about these times? Uh, because I've, 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 you know, if you if you study the the movement or study the market and look at it for for a while, you realize that what we didn't have yesterday, what we didn't have two years ago or three years ago or ten years ago, we're having them now. We're having art historians now. We're having critics now. We're having whereby you could only count Tema Golden and a few others before. You have multiple curators now that they built that looked at her and say, oh, here is somebody that we can reference. So now you're having people that can be, you know, before you won't be able to do that. Now a kid can, can stand up, a black kid can stand up and say, okay, I'm going to be the president of America and the mom is not the dad is not gonna say my friend get out of here you know so <laughs> you know so because there is there is there is there is a precedent you know to that so there are a lot of when we're talking about building institutions we are talking about human resources actually not necessarily like we're going to rebuild the Met or we're going to rebuild the um, of course I mean you can expand the museums but what we are talking about is that what were the humans I mean. Like I always said, black people have always made art from the beginning of time. You're not going to lack that in any way or format, be it in music, be it in visual art, be it in dance, anything you can think of. But how do we harness those things? How do we make those things more last longer? And the people that are actually doing it at that particular time benefit from it at that time. Not because if you have already departed, then somebody has the right to your catalog, somebody that didn't sweat you know, meanwhile, he died in an abject poverty because there were no people, there was no good manager, there was no good accountant, there was nobody to look after that person. Then, you know, that is just washed away. Then somebody is waiting, sitting on that catalog to benefit from it 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. But now we're building those, those, those ecosystems and everybody is buying into it. Like Johnny said, we don't want segregation. I mean, like, you can't suddenly create red lines, okay? We want to have global conversations, okay? If, it's, if we're talking about contemporary art, we shouldn't be like, oh, African contemporary art. Yes, of course, I'm an African, you know, I'm, I'm Nigerian, you understand what I'm saying, but how much of pigeonholing is that when you use that language, when you are criticizing the work, when you're looking at the work? Mm -hmm. You know, I went to Met a few days ago, and I saw a, an ebony wood head of, of, of what you typically think is an African mask, or 
uh, an African sculpture, right? The first thing that will come to you is, oh, is this a, a cutlet? No. You look at it, and when you look at the caption, you realize it's Alexander Carter, who is completely referencing African art. So how do we position certain things like that and all of that? So what we are saying is that let's not draw these lines as much. The same way you will create monographs for uh, an artist from Chicago that is white or from, from China or this thing. Let's, let's have a level playing field as much as possible. It, 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 it sounds like what you're saying is let's not do what those who have oppressed us have done. Let's not continue in the legacy or the tradition of oppression, but let's do something different. I'd like to move the conversation to the idea of the black and or the African artist having to self-educate because the way art is taught is taught in such a way where when you learn about contemporary art in America, in order to learn about black art in America, you have to take classes for black art specifically. To, typically, black art in America isn't taught in a, an American art history class. It's taught in a black art history class. Can you speak to your thoughts about that or why that might be problematic if it's not painfully obvious? I mean, I guess I'm thinking about it in different, because I didn't go through. You're self-taught, yes. Yeah, yeah, so I don't know what it was to be taught that way. Right. <laughs> and, you know, um, yeah, I don't know what it is to be taught about because I'm self-taught, um, didn't. How did you begin to learn about art? How did you begin to discover black artists? Did that happen? It did. Yeah, just contemporary black artists when I started like paying attention to art, like in 2012, 13. Yeah, what was that to, journey like for you? It was... It was... Um, I guess it was eye-opening, you know, just because it was the first time, uh, you know, I was really paying attention, seeing, you know, contemporary art. Um, it was fresh and new to me because I didn't look at a lot of, I didn't make a lot of art before, you know, mm -hmm. and I wasn't, I didn't have anything in my head that was like, oh, I was never taught about these artists, you mm -hmm. know. But um, I mean, you know, for me, I guess because of that, you know, I just went off of, um, just went off of what I felt, you know, and what my spirit felt, and what I enjoyed, and outside of uh, thinking about any particular thing to grab onto, or any particular like roadmap to follow, or any particular aesthetic to follow, or any particular thing to talk about, really. So, <laughs> so in doing that, you know, there was just just a freedom, really, to tap into whatever um, whatever yeah whatever whatever moved me whatever I engaged in you know which was probably you know just a lot of m music and a lot of movement and then just aesthetically like mm -hmm. whatever I liked um, and I guess as I moved along I started to uh, come across and realize that there, like, there were these these rules and ways that I had to make to be received, hmm. and I was really confused by it. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> all right. So, you know, so I mean, you have to kind of, you know, you kind of have to, uh, kind of have to shift in mode to it a little bit to be received, you know? Yeah. Um, that's for sure. But, um, but then I think the key is to, to do that and to educate yourself. Because, you know, you want to, you know, what lineage you're coming behind, you know, and, and you're making and understand it. But I think for me personally is to, to be able to understand how to be in it and to veer, to veer out of it, you know, to mm -hmm. continue your, whatever your, your, your fingerprint and your singularity in making is. Beautiful. Any thoughts? On the question, Does that apply to me? I, I think I right. I think it's a very different question for yeah, you, but I but I'm also I'm also curious what some of your experiences were in school and studying and and what that was like for you. Uh, based on where I grew up, we have a different pedagogical system of, of learning. Let me mm. put it that way. Mm. Um, 
It's a little bit from, you would say, the school of hard knocks. When you don't have, <laughs> when you don't have um, possibly an art teacher that, that can teach you then. But then again, you are looking at it from a Western perspective, if I say that, because I mean, the entire community was my teacher. Right. You know, the museums, the shrines were my museums. You know, the high priests were my MFA teachers. You know? right. So because you walk out on the street, somebody is carving wood. Mm. So if you're going to be an artist, you can sit down after school and just pretty much look at it. Mm. But when, when you look at it from that perspective, a, a, a teacher could come that, is, that has studied in a Western form and say, oh, that is apprenticeship, but I'm asking, what is MFA? You understand what is studio practice, you know. Mm -hmm. So I grew up under those circumstances where they are they are casting. I go through the entire system and look at them. Um, a lady or a woman in the community is painting, and you're looking at the walls. I, I said the first time I looked at Mark Rothko, I thought I was looking at my grandmother's walls because I mean it's like just just exactly the same thing. They would look at it, you know. So. Um, I, I've seen those being painted. I've seen uh, brushes being made from, from, from nature, you know. So I learned from different sources and, and what comes out from me now as an adult is, is kind of like from those different sources where I play with materials and stuff like that. But of course I went to, to a different kind of school too. My background is more like in writing, my MFA is in writing. Uh, I write fiction and creative, uh, non-creative fiction as well. Um, but then again, did I really learn anything from my MFA? Apparently, maybe not. I learned more from my grandmother telling me stories, structuring stories, heightening the stories. What are the cliffhangers? You know. So when you grow up in an environment like that, and you can tap into that always, it's always in that subconsciousness. Then I bring them into consciousness when I'm writing or I'm painting. Um, yeah, poetry on the street, dance drama on the street. Um, if you look at a typical African shrine, what is the difference between the typical African shrine and, and, and when you go to Boma and you see an installation piece? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not strange to me, but I'm just saying that there are ways that we handle nomenclatures, there are ways that we name things, there are ways that we look at things, there are ways we look and arrange things. You know? So, for me, the Western art is sometimes can be funny to me in a way like, oh, I've seen this before. But, <laughs> That's what you want to call it. <laughs> so, you know, so, so it's always fun. I always have fun whenever I go, like, okay, cool. <laughs> I'd like to now talk a little bit about the fact that both of you come to the art world from interesting places. You worked as a nurse, yeah, I believe. I see, I see. Right. I see you nurse before becoming an artist, a writer before becoming a visual artist. And what I was always a visual artist. Anyway. It's oh. writing that interjected. Look at how you just like. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. So please tell me both of you a little bit of your journey into visual arts and, and how did you come to creating? Um, yeah, so I, I um, came into uh, drawing in 2010, um, just doodling while I was in, um, in a nursing class actually just to try to stay away from these classes. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start working in IC. I concentrate better when I do it, though. So, um, yeah, so I, my sister saw my doodles, and she was like, these are pretty good. Mm -hmm. and she gave me a book. I learned how to draw. And then, um, I think the first, like, the first uh, significant thing within that, while I was still working in the ICU, I was started working with uh, electrocardiogram rhythms of patients that I took care of, and the strips, the receipt size strips of the heart rhythms. Um, my sister, she worked with paper as well, um, and materials, so that's kind of why I got interested in materials and paper. And um, I made like individual pieces with them, and that was like me, I was like, oh, I'm making conceptual art. <laughs> But it was a, but it was a, I, you know, I was convicted to work with that, that those, those strips, you know, because mm -hmm. I just, I really, I loved, you know, my job, I loved what I did, and, you know, I was really present with it, so there was nothing else I wanted to do besides make work with, you know, people's rhythms, and from there, um, I made maybe like five or six of those pieces, and like eight months later, maybe they, um, I looked at them, and there were like dots on them, just blemishes, because it wasn't archival. It was like this chemical therm thermal paper. Mm -hmm. So then from there, 
I was like, oh, what am I going to do? This is all I want to do is make work with people's rhythms. Like, it's over for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, a good friend of mine, and that's where I stand square off. He told me to just 